Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 664 for the second of Tishrei in a regular year. This is the episode for the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So once again, I am pre-recording this episode and I hope that uh, you guys all have an amazing Rosh Hashanah or if you're listening to this after the holiday, that you had a really special and meaningful Rosh Hashanah. And once again, I'm wishing you all a Ketiva V'chatimatova and a Gemar V'chatimatova as well, which is what we say after Rosh Hashanah has, uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah is when we, we get written in the books, which is the Ketiva part, um, where Hashem writes down our, you know, what basically our life is going to be like in the coming year. And then it gets sealed on Yom Kippur. So up until throughout the month of Elul, we say to one another, we wish one another to have a Ketiva V'chatimatova, which is that we should be written and signed in, to, in a good way, like have a good writing being good writing and signing like Hashem should write us down for good things uh, and then after Rosh Hashanah is over that's sort of like when Hashem actually wrote these things down we say Gemal that it should um, the conclusion should be a good signing meaning that like even though Hashem does write down basically what's going to happen during the year on Rosh Hashanah there's still time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur um, for this. You know, it's not yet finalized until Yom Kippur comes about itself. So just a little insight for you. And uh, that being said, let's get into today's episode. I want to ask you guys a question. Who are you? What defines who you are? Are you your job, your profession? So some people get really annoyed by this. They don't like it when people kind of like equate them with their profession and kind of feel like it's like there's their professional life and then there's who they are and they get annoyed by, you know, you go to a party and the first thing somebody asks you is, what do, what do you do? And people are like, why do you ask what I do? Why don't you want to know who I am? Other people really own it. Other people really enjoy being defined by their profession. Perhaps they really identify with their profession. But is your profession, is is what you do for your work really, ultimately, does it really encapsulate the entirety of you what about the other things that you do in your life not limited to your profession what about the friends that you have the activities you enjoy doing your hobbies all of that stuff is that you well what about the words that you speak what about the the uh, conversations that you have the the connections that you have with other people that have nothing to do with physical activity so much, but it's more just about connection with others. Is that you? What about the part of you that is has nothing to do with other people necessarily? What about you when you're alone in your room with your thoughts and you're just thinking on the inside and contemplating life? What about when you're not thinking? What about when you're sleeping? Is that you? Maybe that's the real you because it's not defined by any specific aspect of a certain activity or a conversation or something like that, right? So it's not a simple question, what are you, who are you, (laughs) right? So as we'll learn today, just like for a human being, there are multiple layers is a way that we can think about it for, uh, for defining who a person is. There's the external layers of how they manifest themselves to the world. And then there are the internal layers of how they manifest to themselves. This is similar to how God operates the Havdiel. Because again, as we've mentioned several times, we were created in the image of God. So just like we have these 
different layers to ourselves, so too does God have different layers to himself. And in a general sense, we can divide these layers into two aspects. There's the external layers, and then there's the internal layers. In Hebrew, we call the external layers or like the, the, the back side layers as the chitzonim, the outward superficial could be another way to define it and the inward layer we call the pnimius the pnimium which is related to the word face panim in hebrew so that's what we're going to be learning about today and we're specifically going to be learning about this in terms of one specific attribute of god the attribute of chokma so just as a person as a whole or god as a whole the half deal has an external and internal aspect so too when you look at each one of the particular traits of a person or of god the way god manifests himself to to us each one of those traits has an internal aspect to it and an external aspect to it. For example, with a person, let's say if we wanted to talk about a person's wisdom. So a person might be really smart. They might have like a really, really high IQ, let's say, but you may never know that if they never speak, if you, do, if you, if you don't know them very well, you just see a picture of them. Like you wouldn't necessarily know what their mental capacity is based just on a picture alone. Like that would be pretty presumptuous to guess that. But then when you see something that they invented or uh, some project that they worked on or something like that, that really displays their intellect, that's going to give you a, a, a manifestation. That's going to be the external manifestation of their intellect, right? However, for them, that external manifestation of their intellect is actually just a certain reflection of their intellect. It's like a manifestation of their intellect, but on the inside, they it, it's a much deeper experience. Like if somebody were able to actually go in and like experience the person's mind itself who created that invention or that project, they would realize and recognize just how much smarter, how much deeper that person really is. And just it's, it's, it's like nothing compared to that little project that they worked on, that particular invention. Like the capacity is... Uh, of, of what their intellect is capable of and what's going on on the inside is much, much, much deeper, right? So we can all identify with this on a certain level that it's like when we express ourselves to the world in some way, we're expressing a part of ourselves for sure. And we don't want to minimize that, the fact that we're expressing something very deep about ourselves. But the internal experience of who we are is much richer than any particular thing that we can manifest out into the world. So that's what we're going to be learning about today, specifically in regards to God and specifically in regards to God's attribute of chokhmah, of wisdom, quote unquote, loosely translated, again, um, better translated as like intuit, intuition, the very beginning spark of the intellect as it becomes manifest um, in consciousness, kind of. Uh, so yeah, so let, let's get into the text and see how the Altar Abba explains this. So for context, we are in the middle of Epistle uh, 19 in Igeris HaKodesh. And we tar started out this epistle discussing this whole idea of Moses' prophecies, Moshe's prophecies, his prophetic abilities, and the Kabbalist, and contrasting those things. And we likened Moshe's prophecies to vision, while the Kabbalists were uh, their understanding of Kabbalah, of, of the of the levels of godliness was likened more to hearing, which is more of like a, a kind of understanding kind of thing. Um, and we were we talked about the idea of how Moshe's uh, vision, while it was very strong, and really he was the strongest prophet that ever lived, the the prophet that saw the most. Nevertheless, his vision was quite limited, and he was and in on the level of uh, levels of godliness of what he was able to see and experience when it came to the level of chokhmah of um, of that divine wisdom, that first intellectual attribute, his experience of it, of it was only on the level of a haraim, of in a backhanded manner, in an external superficial way. Whereas the Kabbalists were able to discuss this attribute of chokhmah in a more internal way, they too were not able to experience it in a vision way because they didn't experience anything in a vision way. But for Moshe, who was a prophet and did experience godliness in a more visual, quote unquote, like a spiritually visual way, like in a vision, visionary kind of way, even for Moshe Rabbeinu, he was only able to experience this level of chokhmah 
in an external superficial manner. So today we're going to talk about what that means exactly. What is the external aspect of Chochmah and, um, and how do we contrast that with the internal aspect of Chochmah? So the altar of it begins and he says that when we talk about this aspect of the Chochmah, the godly Chochmah that's vested within the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah, this is what we can reference as being the Achoraim of Chochmah. It's an aspect of the backside of Chochmah. Achor means backside in Hebrew. So the 613 commands of the Torah are what we know of as the backside of Chochmah. So why? What does that mean? Because every aspect, when we talk about the Achoraim of the Sphiros, what is the backside of the sphere? So every sphere has a front side and it has a back side to it. So the back side of the sphere is the external aspects of the sphere, and it's the lower, it's on a lower level than uh, than the sphere itself. Meaning, why is it on a lower level? This is the aspect of the sphere that can come down and that can flow outwards and influence the lower realms in uh, and the created beings in order to animate them. So in order to animate all of existence, which is what the spheres do, they need to have this lower, more external aspect to them, this, this backside to them. That is what, what influences the lower realms. By contrast, what is the front side, the face of the sphere? The face of the sphere is the sphere itself. And this is the aspect of the sphere that is really unified with its emanator, meaning with God, with utmost unity. So this is true for all the spheres. All the spheres have this backside and they have a front side. So for example, today we're talking about the sphere of Chochmah. So the sphere of Chochmah, the, the front side of the sphere of Chochmah is totally unified with its emanator, with utmost unity, because as we explained, God and his Chochmah are one, right? And that which ex extends outwards from his Chochmah down here into the lower realms who are, we're all limited here, right? And we're all, um, we all have, uh, we're, we're finite beings. We have finitude, limitations, all of that stuff. When God's Chochmah comes down here and becomes vested within all of these limited things, which is how the whole world is in existence, this is what's called the Achoraim. This is the backside of the sphere of Chochmah. And another way to refer to this, so there's a lot of like cinema, synonyms here, like it's different ways of describing uh, these different terms, these different levels. So another way to think of the Achoraim of Chochmah is we can think of it as being the Asiya of Atzillus. So just to kind of map that out again, again and again, this is where it can sound really confusing when we use these terms, these Kabbalistic terms, and they're used in a very relativistic way. So if you recall, when we talked about the different types of worlds, there are four general spiritual worlds. The most highest of all of them is Atsilas. Next below that is Bria. Then you have Yetzira. And then the lowest of all the worlds is Asiya. But now found within each one of these worlds, you have the aspects of all the worlds within each world. So within Atsilas, you can say that there's the Atsilas of Atsilas, there's the Bria of Atsilas, the Yetzirah of Atsilas, and the Asiya of Atsilas, which is the lowest aspects of Atsilas. So in this case, what we're saying here is we're saying that the backside of Chochmah can also be understood as being the Asiya of Atsilas, because it's like the lowest aspect of Atsilas. It's, this is where the Chochmah become, is, is becoming manifest to the realms below it. And the Ultra Bar says that we can come to understand this also, like just like when we think about a, a person who has a soul, and within a person's soul, a soul is actually composed of five different levels, each one from above to below. So what are the five levels of the soul? Just uh, to kind of give that review. So there's the Chida, that's the highest one. Then there's the Chaya. Then we have the neshama, then the ruach, and then the nefesh. Those are the five levels of the soul. And a, in a general way, the way that we can think about the, these five levels of the soul and what they correspond to. So we have the first two, the highest levels of the soul, the echida and the chaya. These are a little bit more like um, they are, they're not 
vested within the body itself. They're kind of like hovering outside of the body. So there's something a little bit more um, esoteric about them. And so those aspects of the soul, those correspond to the more essential soul attributes, which are the seichel and the midos, the intellect and the emotions, the emotive attributes, where the yichida corresponds to the intellect, intellect and then uh, the midos corresponds to the emotive attributes. Then the three lower levels of the soul, the neshama, ruach, and nefesh, these correspond to the vestments of the soul, the garments of the soul that the soul uses to vest itself here in this body. And to be specific, what they correspond to is the neshama corresponds to the machshava, the, the thought, the thinking faculty of the soul, the thinking garment of the soul. The ruach corresponds to dibur, to speech, the speaking aspect of the soul, that which allows us to speak. And then the nefesh corresponds to maise, to action. That's what allows us to act in the world, to do things in the world in a physical sense. And this level of action, this level of maise is the lowest of all of them. So what does this mean that it's the lowest of all of them? Well, so that when we think about the life force that extends out from the soul and the life force that extends out from the soul becomes vested in each one of these soul powers that we've been describing, whether it's the intellect, the emotions, the thought, the speech, the action, all of that. And the life force of the vitality of the soul that's, that's vested within this faculty of action, this power of action is like nothing compared to the vitality that spreads forth that is vested within the power of speech. So on a simple level, what that means is that like when a person is doing something, let's say you're picking up a cup of water and you're drinking the water or whatever, it's like that is like when we're going back to the discussion of who are you? Is like, are you a person who drinks water? Sure, yes, you are a person that drinks water, but that is such an external manifestation of who you are that it's like nothing compared to the words that you speak. Like if, to really, if, if you want to develop a really deeper uh, appreciation of a person and understanding of a person, most likely you'll be able to get to know them a lot in a much deeper way if you hear them speak than if you just like see them pick up a cup of water, right? <laughs> or something like that, or do something like very external, like, like, like just do an action. And that's because the vitality of the soul that is, that is present when a person does an action, when uh, that's in the faculty of action, while it is very strong, because that's what's vivifying the body to be able to do these actions, it's like nothing compared to the vitality of the soul that comes about through, that's manifest in the speech. And the vitality of the soul that's present and manifest in a person's speaking in the faculty of speech is like nothing compared to the vitality of the soul that is vested within thought and within the emotive attributes of the soul and in the intellect of the soul, right? So just again, going back to that. So it's like, sure, when you hear somebody speak, that maybe might give you a deeper insight into who they are versus if you just see them doing a certain action. But even their speech is somewhat like it's, it's, it's lacking in terms of really the profundity of who they are. A person on a certain level, the vitality of who they are is much more intense when we think about their thought and when we think about their essential makeup, the essential makeup of like, what are, what are their emotive attributes? What's their personality? What is their IQ? What's their intellect? What's their intellectual capacities? What's their creativity? How creative are they? All that stuff that's going on in the inside, that's where the vitality is going to be a lot stronger in terms of the soul vitality than merely the, the words that they speak and the action that they do. Those are more external manifestations. And so the altar rabbi concludes and he says that just like this, so that's a parable that we're using to understand um, this essential aspect of, of, of chokhmah, of God's chokhmah, and what comes down into the world here and becomes vested in the world here. So just like, so to just to bring it all together, so just like we were describing basically before that what we experience down here in the world can be thought of as being the asiya of Atsilus, meaning that it's the lower lowest world within the general higher world of Atsilus. So it's like we, this world is kind of like God's faculty of Chachma, but as manifest in action. So it's like this world is a very external manifestation of it's like that person who's drinking the water, right? It's as opposed to their inner thoughts and their inner wisdom that's going on.
So up until now, it might sound as if, uh, you know, superficiality is really a negative thing. And it's kind of like we're really lacking in the sense that we're only experiencing the superficiality of Hashem's Chochmah and not the more internal aspect of Hashem's Chochmah, which is true in a certain, it, in a big way. We really are lacking and it's something to be aware of that we're only experiencing Hashem's, the externality, externality of Hashem's Chochmah. However, as we'll now see, uh, there actually is an advantage to this and that is in the sense that that's what ma- allows us to be receptive to Hashem's Chochmah. And that's what specifically allowed Moshe Rabbeinu, specifically who is the transmitter of the Torah, how he was able to receive the Torah in such a way that he could transmit it to us. And how indeed this whole transmission to us and to bring the Torah down into the world and you know ultimately make this world into a dwelling place for God, that is the whole point. So as you know, as nice and um, and fascinating the internal aspect of Hashem's Chachma may be, that ultimately is not uh, the point. The point of Hashem creating the world, the point of Hashem's Chachma is to bring it down, is to have this more superficial, quote unquote, kind of world. Um, in which we actually do uh, uh, relate to God through the Torah, which is this more external manifestation of uh, Hashem's Chochmah, which is still connected very much to his Chochmah. It's not a different thing. It's just a different angle of viewing Hashem's Chochmah. So we were explaining the difference between the external and, and, and the internal powers, soul powers in terms of a person. Now the altar bit goes on and he explains that this is exactly the same when it comes to God. So the altar Rebbe says that like this is exactly how we can think about it. When we think about God's Chochmah, what can come out of God's Chochmah to become vested here in the lower realms, all of everything here in this lower realm is considered like not and nothing compared to the inward aspect, which is totally unified with God. We're, we're about that level is described in the Zohar as being kula kamia kelo chashiv, that all is like nothing compared to him. So basically, just to explain that, so the so we know that Hashem creates the entire world through Chochmah, through the attribute of Chochmah. But what the Alter Rebbe is teaching us here is that the attribute of Chochmah, the way that it's manifest down here, the way that we experience the world down here is like nothing compared to the aspect of Chochmah as it is found in an internal sense and unified with God. And the influence that comes down here for all of the created beings who are limited and finite, right, is considered to be a tremendous urida, a tremendous descent, and a tremendous contract, contraction, constriction uh, in comparison to, so to speak, in comparison to the to the emanator himself, to in, to God. So, right, so just like by way of analogy, says the Ultra Rebbe, if we think about the great descent that needs to happen in the intellect of a person who needs to constrict their thoughts in a certain action, a very physical kind of action. So it's like, let's say if we need, like we don't think about it so much because it's kind of like an automatic process that we need to do, but the amount of intellectual energy that needs to happen in order for us to merely just like take a walk down the street or something like that, our brain needs to go through a bunch of different constrictions, a bunch of different contractions in order to manifest in that particular action that we're going to do. So this is similar to the to how it is that God creates the world through his chokhmah. God creating the world through his chokhmah, that's likened to that level of action. So it's a tremendous descent. It's a tremendous contraction. And so now we can understand, now we bring back Moshe Rabbeinu. We understand why it is that Moshe Rabbeinu, who he was able to understand godliness uh, right up until the point of the backside of Chochmah, that's why he specifically merited to have the Torah be given through him. Because the Torah is what's called the Novlot Chochmah, which literally translates to mean the vestige of, of this of Chochmah, meaning to say it's that which is like kind of left over the vestige from that Chochmah that is above and that comes down here and becomes vested within the Torah and the, the physical Torah that we have. Because Torah, you, as much as we think of Torah as being this like spiritual type of thing, at the end of the day, a, a Torah, is, a Sefer Torah is a physical object, right? And it relates to our physical world. So this is just, a this Torah that we have is like a vestige of God's Chochmah, of God's ultimate wisdom. 
And the ultimate purpose of the Torah is to keep the mitzvahs, right? To keep the mitzvahs lotase, the negative prohibitions and the positive commandments, and to do them in actuality, to really do them, as it says, says the Altar Rabbah, and he states Dvarim chapter 7, verse 11, Hayom lasotam, today you should do it. So the whole point of Torah is it's, meant, it's not just meant to be a book that we just study in a theoretical way. It's meant to be an action book that actually teaches us how to actually live in our life. And another citation that the Altar Rabbah brings here, this time from the Gemara in Kedushin, page 40b, where it says, Gadol Talmud Vile de Mase. The study of Talmud, the study of Torah, is great if it bring, comes, brings to action. So it's always all about the action. And another citation, this is from Vayikra Rabra, uh, 35.7, where it says, Halomed shelo la'asot noach lo shnefcha shaliato v'chule. One who um, learns with the in intent of not doing, it's better as if his afterbirth, his placenta, had been turned over. So it's like better, basically, it's like a, a poetic way of saying it's better as if he was never born. So the main idea of Torah mitzvahs is to do them, their action oriented, right? And we know, and then the ultra concludes here, that uh, that every person needs to actually become reincarnated. Yes, we believe in reincarnation in Judaism. We need to be reincarnated until the point that we keep all of the 613 mitzvahs in actuality, as is known from the Arizal. So that's the end of the section today. And so just to kind of bring that all together. So the basic idea is that we're maybe you know, learning yesterday's episode. It sounds like superficiality gets this like really bad rap. Um, but we learned here the positive aspect of superficiality in the sense that the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu was only able to see up until the external aspects of God's Chochmah, that actually allowed him to merit receiving the Torah because the Torah is also the superficial aspect, the external aspect of God's Chochmah, the vestige of God's Chochmah, so to speak. And we know that since that aspect of the vest of, uh, of externality is associated with the attribute of action and action um, and, and, and doing things, that's why we see that, that very much so Torah is all about mitzvahs and it's all about doing. It's all about action in that way. So that's it for today. And we will continue and conclude this epistle tomorrow when we actually begin a new paragraph of this epistle. So stay tuned and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Benyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.